Hi, today we're going to talk about the water molecule and the key properties of water. If you're following along with your notes, now's the time to get them out. If you need to pause it at any time, feel free to do that or rewind it if there's something you need to hear again. Let's get started. Okay, let's just start off and see how much you know. I have four statements here. We're going to read each statement and I want you to decide if it's true or if it's false. We're going to return to these statements at the end of the presentation and see what you learned. So first one, water can hold heat. Is it true or false? The second one, some animals can stand or walk on water. Is it true or false? Number three, water can move up narrow tubes against the force of gravity. True or false? Number four, the abundance of water is a major reason Earth can support life. True or false? Let's get started. Here's a picture of a very basic, simple water molecule. All matter is made up of atoms and water is no different. We know that atoms bond to each other to form molecules. A molecule is the smallest piece of that compound that has the same properties. Take a look at this number. Do you have any ideas what it might be? It's not two million. It's not two billion. It's not two trillion. It is actually two million quadrillion. Why would we look at a number that big when we're talking about water? Well, it kind of blows my mind that one drop of water has two million quadrillion molecules. A single large drop of water weighs a tenth of a gram and has about three billion trillion water molecules. Something to think about. So if we look at the mo water molecule, here's another representation. We know that the chemical formula for water is H2O. Two is the subscript and that tells us that there are two hydrogen atoms. If you look here at the water molecule, it kind of resembles a Mickey Mouse. We have the two ears, which are our hydrogen, because we know that we have two hydrogen atoms. And then we have kind of the face of Mickey Mouse, which would be your oxygen. So we know that water has two hydrogen atoms and it has one oxygen atom. So water has this really cool property which means it is a polar molecule. Polar molecules are molecules that have electrically charged areas. If we go back to our water molecule and we look at back at the Mickey Mouse shape, you can see that the ears, which are our hydrogen atoms, are represented with positive signs. That's because the hydrogen atoms have a slightly positive charge. The oxygen atom in the center has a slightly negative charge. That's because water is a polar molecule, so it has electrically charged areas, right? Hydrogen positive, oxygen negative, and we know that different charges attract each other. Think about a battery, right? When you connect them, you connect the positive end to the negative end, right? So we know that the positive ends of one molecule attract the negative oxygen ends of the nearby water molecules. It's kind of like playing an electron tug of war. This is what makes the molecules stick together. We can't live without water. It's essential for all things. And you probably know that 97% of the Earth's water is salt water, right? That's mostly our oceans. Now, if we look at the fresh water, 3% of what's left is fresh water. Now, not all of that fresh water can be used. Some of it's locked up in glaciers. So it's really important that we conserve the water that we have because we don't have that much fresh water. We need water for so many of life's functions. So I want you to just take a couple minutes and on your paper, brainstorm the answers to these questions. Why is fresh water so important? And what are some ways that living things use water? So go ahead, pause it, 
take a second to write your answers, and hit the play button when you're ready to go again. Okay, we're going to break this down into six different properties of water. Cohesion, adhesion, capillary action, surface tension, universal solvent, and specific heat. Let's start off with cohesion and adhesion. Cohesion, just take a second and look at the word cohesion. If you have your note sheet, go ahead and circle the co. Co is usually two things working together. So co-pilots, right? We have two pilots in the cockpit of a plane. Co-worker, two workers sticking together, okay? Cooperate, two people working together. So cohesion is water molecules sticking together. They stick to other water molecules and they form clumps of water. Okay, so water is attracted to another water molecule. Cohesion, water attracted to water. Now, if you look at this, this image down here, you'll notice that the positive end is gonna be attracted to the negative end. Adhesion is really like the opposite. Adhesion is water molecules that are attracted to molecules of other materials. So adhesion might be, for example, water sticking to a leaf, water sticking to a flower, water sticking to the window. Okay, cohesion is water droplets sticking to water droplets. So for example, if you've ever looked at the stream of water coming out of your shower or the stream of water coming out of your sink, those water molecules are sticking together in that stream. That is an example of cohesion. Okay, let's take a second and move on. Here's a really cool activity at the bottom that you can try at home. I'd love to do it in the classroom. So if you take a look down here, you'll notice that there are seven cups. What I would do is I would fill the first cup, the third cup, the fifth cup, and the seventh cup with the primary colors. And then leave the three middle cups empty. Take a paper towel and connect the paper towel from the first cup to the second cup, and from the second to the third, and the third to the fourth, and so on. And watch and see what happens. If you wait a couple hours, you'll notice that eventually the water that's in those full cups is starting to actually move up the paper towel and move into the empty cup. And you'll notice that the colors tend to mix because we're mixing red and yellow and we're getting orange, or we're mixing blue and yellow and getting green and so on. That's a great example of capillary action, okay? Capillary action is that combined force of attraction among water molecules with molecules of a surrounding material. So that water molecule is attracted and being attracted to the paper towels and that force is causing it to move. So there's a lot of cool examples of capillary action that we never really probably think about. If you take a second and you would put a straw, a clear straw inside a liquid, you'll notice that the, that the liquid is not even with the, the liquid inside the straw is not even with the liquid outside of the straw. The actual straw is a little bit higher. That's because capillary action actually forces that water up the straw a little bit. If you buy Under Armour clothing or Nike Dry Fit, any of those athletic clothings that are supposed to wick the sweat away from you, this works because of the principle of capillary action. Plants taking in water is another example of capillary action. That water moves through the roots and up the stem. The next example we're going to take a look at here is surface tension. Now surface tension is very different than something floating. If you look at this picture here, this is um, a insect called a water strider. It's not floating on the water. 
If you look at the picture very, very carefully around the ed edges of the water strider's legs, you'll notice a little dimple where the water actually kind of indents. Because water is cohesive and is attracted to each other, it, on the surface of the water, it causes a tightness because of these polar molecules that pull on each other. And because of this tightness, that's what's called surface tension. Surface, it happens on the surface of the water. Tension means tightness. So it's almost like there's a thin skin of water molecules that this water strider is kind of pushing on. Now, if you took a drop of a uh, piece of wax paper at your house and placed a drop of water onto it and took a second to look closely at the drop, you'll notice it actually is a spherical shape. It's not flat. So think about what might be happening here. And if you have some wax paper in your kitchen, go ahead and pause this, take a second, and just put a drop of water on it. Well, you'll notice that the water is a spherical shape. It's not attracted to the wax paper. There's no adhesion between the molecules and the drop. So it causes the water to pull itself into a shape with the smallest amount of surface area, and that's what's making that bead shape or that sphere shape. All of the water molecules on the surface of the bead are holding each other together and creating that surface tension. Um, surface tension is what causes raindrops to bead on a windshield, right? If you sprinkle pepper in your soup, the pepper doesn't float on top of the soup, but it's actually the surface tension that keeps the pepper sitting on that top skin because the polar molecules are pulling on each other. So let's take a look at some examples here. Water strider, like we just looked at in the picture. Raindrops beating on a window. Bubbles in water are another example of surface tension. And I'm sure everyone has done a belly flop at one time or another. It really hurts. That's because when your body hits the water, that tightness across the surface of the water caused by those polar molecules is what hits and smacks and causes that belly flop to really, really hurt. Now, water also has another cool property and it's called the universal solvent. Universal means like everything, right? If you have a universal TV remote, it works on many different TVs not just one brand of TV. So water dissolves more substances than any other type of liquid. And that's why they call it the universal solvent. Again, because water is a polar molecule with electrically charged areas, it can dissolve some, not all, solids, some liquids, and some gases. So before we discuss it, just pause it and take a second and think, are there any solid liquids and gases that you can think of that would dissolve? Well, let's look at a list. Just for example, think about sugar. You put sugar in your coffee, stir it up, it dissolves. Salt, if I'm boiling water to make spaghetti and I pour salt in the water, that salt dissolves. Pills dissolve in water. Maybe you've taken an Alka-Seltzer tablet and put it in and notice that it bubbles and fizz if you have a cold. We know there's liquids that dissolve in water too, like bleach or dishwashing detergent, orange juice concentrate, okay? They all dissolve with water. If you like a nice bubbly soda, right, a nice Coke, it's that carbon dioxide that's dissolved in the liquid, that gas, that causes it to be bubbly. So water dissolves lots of different substances. Again, not every substance, okay? Water is hydrophobic. So it doesn't dissolve oils and it doesn't dissolve fats. But it's really heavily attracted to some molecules that it kind of disrupts that attractive force and dissolves it. And again, that's because water is a polar molecule. Is it possible to be able to speed up the dissolving rate of a substance? 
take a second and think about what are some different things that you can do that would cause something to dissolve in water a little bit more quickly. Pause it, brainstorm, and when you think you're ready, come on back and we'll talk about them. Well, one of the very first things that you can do to make something dissolve more quickly would be to crush it. So, for example, if I had a sugar cube that was maybe one centimeter by one centimeter, that sugar cube would take longer to dissolve in water as a full sugar cube than if I crushed it into pieces. Okay, crushing it makes those particles smaller and that means there's more surface area for that solvent to be able to touch it. We know powders dissolve faster than cubes. Another way that you could dissolve something more quickly in water would be to stir it. Okay, stirring speeds up how fast that solvent or that water touches your substance. And the last thing that helps to dissolve objects very quickly is increasing the temperature. We know hot liquids hold more solids and it speeds up the dissolving. So hot water is going to hold more sugar in it than cold water will. Let's think back to winter time. Maybe it's winter time right now where you live. If you take a look at this picture, this truck is dropping road salts during a snowstorm. Does that affect our environment? Think for a second, how? Well, as it's dropping these road salts, they don't just disappear, right? Spring comes and those road salts are laying on the road, laying in the grass, it rains, it dissolves. Think about that runoff, where does it go? Into our rivers, maybe our lakes, maybe our streams, okay? And the very last property of water we're gonna talk about today is specific heat. Specific heat has a kind of crazy definition. It's the amount of heat needed to increase the temperature of a certain mass of a substance by one degree Celsius. What does that mean? Well, it means that water has a really, really high specific heat. And this high specific heat is why water stays cool when the weather's hot. A high specific heat keeps the water from heating up as quickly as the other materials do. So for example, if I'm at the pool and it's a hot day, the pavement and the concrete around the pool is very hot in your bare feet. The pavement might be 100 degrees. But as soon as you jump into the water, the water might be a temperature of 68 or 70. It's definitely not as hot as the pavement. It feels great when you jump in. That's because it takes a lot of energy and a lot of heat to be able to increase water. It has a very high specific heat, so it doesn't get hot nearly as quickly. Specific heat is really important. It helps to regulate our environment and it regulates those extreme temperatures in our environment. Um, keeps the water temperature from changing very quickly. This is a really good thing because think about from wintertime to summertime, it, aquatic animals are able to adapt very slowly to changes in the temperature throughout the year, right? It doesn't just go from being 80 degree water to 40 degree water. Things would die, okay? So it's really important about helping animals to adapt slowly. Another really cool thing about specific heat is that land that's near large bodies of water, like oceans or large lakes, have less dramatic temperature changes than areas farther inland. So for example, if you live in a coastal area, your winters are gonna be more mild. Your temperatures are gonna be more moderate, not as extreme as if someone who lives farther inland. We know in the summer, the sun's heat warms the land a lot more quickly than the water does and that warm land heats the air above it to a higher temperature than the air that's over the ocean. So as a result, the air is warmer inland than it is on the coast. The opposite occurs in the winter time. Land loses heat more quickly than the water, so the air above the land is cooler. 
So let's take a second and just kind of go back and reflect on some of the things that we've talked about and what we've learned today. Water can hold heat, true or false. Some animals can stand or walk on water, true or false. Water can move up narrow tubes against the force of gravity, true or false. The abundance of water is a major reason Earth can support life, true or false. If you answer true to all of these questions, you're absolutely correct and you get an A plus for today.